So um, this is the first lecture of quantum field theory two. We're gonna start by a review of what we discussed in QFT one, very, very quick review. The story started by saying that quantum mechanics and relativity, if you try to put them together, you must allow for pair production. You must allow for pair production. We argue for that, which means that there is, it's no longer a viable choice to discuss a theory with a fixed number of particles. You should have all particles all at once. So you should discuss the Fox space. There are two ways where there were two equivalent pictures. One was the many particle theory, where you include all the multi-particle sectors. And then the alternative equivalent picture was field theory, where you discuss fields are your fundamental degrees of freedom and their particles are emergent. At this level, these were two equivalent formal steps. There were advantages to field theory picture. First of all, it was intrinsically many body. It allowed for pair creation naturally. It explained antiparticles that we had to introduce by hand if we're sticking to the particle picture. And most importantly, this is not a convenience, but it's actually a, a conceptual advantage, is that at strong coupling, quantum field theory exists as a theory, whereas the particle picture might fall apart. So these two options we discussed, one of them could fall apart, whereas the other one should be, or is taken as the definition of what strongly coupled many body physics uh, is. So the problem of strongly coupled quantum field theory is one of the deepest and most important problems of uh, 21st century unsolved problem in the 21st century theoretical physics. And uh, that is one of the goals of a lot of research that's done in the field. So I want you guys to have in mind always the problem of strong coupling, where a lot of times we're dealing with systems that are so deeply in the quantum regime, they don't have a notion of particle or even quasi-particle. If you recall, we discussed what quasi-particles are. All right. Um, so that was a very, very brief review. <laughs> there will be two parts to this course, part two of the course. There will be part one and part two. Previously, uh, we had also two parts. Part one was classical field theory, and part two was canonical, uh, was quantization, perturbative quantization. In part one, we're going to continue with perturbative methods. In part two, we're going to switch gears and switch to non-perturbative methods. So part one, I was planning on following uh, Pascal Schroeder and part two doing all sorts of crazy things. Um, so in part one, we're going to go over renormalization group, something that I talked a lot, like I mentioned a lot, but we didn't really discuss systematically. This is now, we're, it's now time to discuss that. We're going to go over the quantization of non-abelian gauge theories properly. Um, and then we're going to discuss symmetry breaking, the origin of mass in the universe, um, as one example. Then, for non-perturbative methods, this is up to us to decide what we include. For now, here's my ambitious list. I don't think we're gonna to get to all of them. I would like to discuss what exact RG is, non-perturbative definition of normalization group is. Uh, what is operator product expansion? This is perhaps my absolute favorite thing in this list. The story of anomalies, perhaps less uh, important in terms of like urgent, Extended field configurations, instant time solid counts, those kind of things, um, and large N. So these are non perturbative methods or tools that I wanted to list. Uh, if there are other suggestions, uh, I don't think we're going to get to all of them. We'll see how fast we go. But if you have other suggestions, just bring them up. OK. We said that field theory is founded on these principles. I listed four of them. I mostly discuss, we mostly discussed locality and symmetry in depth, right? There was the issue of renormalization that we're gonna get into properly now, or we call this separation of scales. And uh, um, you could discuss renormalization at the level of classical field theory. So locality and symmetry, we discussed them at the level of the classical theory in depth. Uh, to discuss renormalization in the classical theory, you need the notion of fluctuations or coarse graining. That could be arranged for with thermal fluctuations. So you could discuss uh, renormalization fully in classical, fine temperature classical field theory, partition function, coarse grain, right? 
But if you are interested, I taught a whole course on this. It's all on my website. But uh, there's an approach to that, right? So you don't necessarily, you don't, it's not essential to talk about quantum to talk to discuss uh, normalization. Okay, and uh, the finally the other principle I would mention is the spectrum condition, positivity of energy. All right, this is a slide from my last lecture from uh, last semester. Another thing I want to re remind you guys is something that I briefly mentioned in the last lecture of uh, part two, uh, 251. There are various approaches to quantum field theory in this course, including this semester, we're gonna be focused on the Lagrangian formulation. But I want you guys to have, keep in mind that these are not the only approaches to quantum field theory. There's a constructive quantum field theory based on Whiteman axioms, algebraic quantum field theory based on uh, the representations of observable algebras, von Neumann C star algebras. There's an operator product algebra, which is an approach to quantum field theory, mostly useful for conformal field theories, special quantum field theories with very, with very large symmetry, space time symmetry groups. And then there's a geometric approach, which is also very, very useful for topological quantum field theories, right? We'll not discuss them in this course. It would be, these would be, require like an advanced topic uh, and it would be appropriate as its own, it needs its own like uh, time and place, but I'll try to comment on them if, I, if as we go along, if there's something that I could mention. The truth of the matter is that, especially when we're thinking of non-perturbative effects and uh, phenomena in quantum field theory, often these appro these other approaches are, sometimes these other approaches are more convenient, especially the operative product. All right, any questions? So if you stick to the perturbative regime, yeah. are, like, are all of these methods equally as effective or are, are, there, are there other like, uh, methods that are like, much more effective? And, like, uh, Within the realm of perturbation theory, I think these these are all equivalent in a sense. There's not, well, no, that's not quite true. I would say that the conceptual advantage is really when you're talking about perturbations. But let me not make a generic grand statement. But it's, it's better to discuss case by case, case by case. All right, good. So with that said, we're going to start our discussion of renormalization. So part one of QFD2 is going to be our renormalization group, right? And we're going to talk about the systematics of renormalization. We're going to start the discussion today, and we're going to keep it pretty light for today, but we'll quickly get into uh, fancier stuff. So if you recall in the previous uh, semester, we discussed QED at one loop, right? And we discussed three particular, there were three diagrams, there were three Feynman diagrams that were picked as very important. There was a fermion self energy at one loop, there was a vacuum polarization at one loop, and there was a vertex correction at one loop. We claim, we just said it, that these are the only divergent diagrams we have to deal with or we have to care for. How do we know this? I didn't argue for that. I just we one by one discussed these and then I said, oh, this is all that we need to care about. So to see why these are the only ones to that we need to care about, today we're gonna come up with the idea of dimension counting. So we're gonna introduce some generalities that will tell you that in a, so a theory of QED was a theory with a gauge boson, a U1 gauge boson, and coupled to some fermion, right? Some massive fermion. Um, what if your theory is something else? So it has some other matter content, right? We discuss all sorts of different theories you could write down based on the spin and the mass. So we're going to discuss in each of such each such theory what is the analysis that you have to do that will tell you what are the diagrams that you need to consider, right? So is, that's the goal of this lecture. In the remaining time is that clear? All right. Let's start with QED, right? Take any QED diagrams, diagram, there will be always a bunch of external legs. Let's say, so the external legs are either electrons or photons, right? Let's say you have NE electron, external electron lines, N gamma 
external photon lines. PE is the number of electron propagators. P gamma is the photon propagators. V is the number of vertices. And L is the number of loops. The uh, toolkit we had, the Legos that we had for Feynman diagrams, uh, was told us that basically every propagator of electron will contribute as 1 over k. Every propagator of photon is 1 over k squared. Photon loops in four, sorry, loops in four dimensions would could uh, four means three plus one. Uh, could would contribute to k to the power of four. So if you were to just count the number of the superficially the power of momenta, you would get the power of k in numerator minus the power of k in denominator for any particular uh, diagram, and you would get a superficial degree of divergence, which is four times the number of loops minus the number of electron propagators minus twice the number of photon propagators. It's a simple count, right? All right, good. So the rough picture is that every diagram I draw on the board, no matter how crazy, I'm gonna calculate the superficial degree of divergence. And uh, I'm gonna roughly speaking assume that if this just uh, D, this superficial degree of divergence is positive, this diagram diverges like the cutoff, you'll be cut off to the power of D. If it's zero, it diverges like log of lambda, log of the cutoff. And if D is negative, it's a finite diagram. This is flawed. What I just said is incorrect, but it's a guide. And I'll give counter examples, right? We all we already know counterexamples. Do you recall what was the counterexample that we discussed in detail? You consider three diagrams, two of them were counterexamples. Out of these three, do you remember? All right, well, we'll get there. All right, so is that clear? Good. Now, these variables I introduced here, they're not independent. They are related. Acute argument tells you that the number of loops is always equal to the number of prop electron propagators plus photon propagators minus number of vertices plus one. You guys know why? You could easily convince yourself this is true. But roughly speaking, the idea is very simple. If you think about Feynman diagrams, every prop internal propagator, you're, any propagator you introduce is a new variable, right? Because you have an amplitude that's a function, your amplitude is a function of external legs, right? Any propagator you introduce in a, in the, inside the diagram is something that you will have to integrate over, right? It's a new variable. So every electron propagator or photon propagator comes with a new integral. And now every vertex comes with a direct delta function that imposes uh, conservation, conservation of momentum, right? So that kills one. Every propagator of electron or photon adds one degree of freedom. Every vertex removes one, right? And this one is to get the counting of loops correctly. So the simplest example to consider is, oops, this, right? So let's say there's just one propagator here, right? So P, I, I make it to be this, right? So P, E is zero, P gamma is one, V is two, because this is this has no loops, you have to add plus one at the end. Now take this and run with it and do all sorts of examples and convince yourself this is the right way to think about it, okay? All right. So this is one relation between these variables I introduced. There are other relations. Uh, in particular, in QED, every vertex always comes with two electron propagators and one photon propagator, right? So the number of vertices has to be equal to time two times the number of electron propagators plus the number of photon propagators. Good. So now we have three relations. You have this which is degree of super, superficial degree of divergence written in terms of these variables. And now the number of vertices is related to, th this relates to 
the variables again, and this is another relation. Putting all of these to, together, you learn that the superficial degree of divergence in QED, something funny happens here. Depends only on the number of external photon and electron uh, lengths. It's independent of what goes on inside the uh, diagram, this blob, right? The amputated diagrams, remember, that we, were, we always were drawing? There could be anything in there, right? All that matters is the number of external lengths, photon and electron. This is very special to QED in four dimensions. And this is the origin of why those three diagrams were sufficient and we didn't need to worry about anything else. I'll say in a, a few minutes that QED, same theory, in higher in other dimensions, will this degree, superficial degree of divergence will depend on the number of vertices as well. In four dimensions, where three plus one is a is a coincidence, say it doesn't. Okay, is that good? All right. So all that we need to do is count the external legs, but when you talk about the number of external legs, when it's independent of what's going on inside the diagram, it tells you that the divergence of the amplitude of the diagram is decided by, the amplitude is decided by the diagrams, right? Because to every amplitude, amplitude fixes the external legs and sums over all everything that's inside, right? So all you need to care about is the external legs. So for instance, if you have a, there's a, to amplitude, there is some contribution coming from like a certain number of loops and certain number of vertices that diverges in a particular way. Any other diagram with, uh, diagram with other number of uh, vertices will still diverge the same way, right? That's important. Is that established? Good. Okay. So now let's jump into it and look at this a little bit more carefully. Because I can, it's, it's all the, based on the number of external lengths. I'm just going to draw this as a blob, right? This yellow blob in the middle and just focus on the outside, right? So the zero point function when there are no external lengths. This is a vacuum diagram and it diverges like the superficial degree of divergence is four. When I say, yeah, I should, how it diverges is not the same as the superficial degree of divergence, right? It's dimension counting. So it needs equal four. This is irrelevant to scattering. This is unphysical. Do you guys remember what this contributes to? Normalization. Of vacuum energy. Yeah, normalization of the vacuum wave function. Yes. So in quantum field theory, we don't care about that. In quantum, flat space quantum field theory, in the absence of gravity, we don't care about that, so we just discard this. These are all the divergences we're getting rid of, right? It's irrelevant to scattering. Then there's a one-point function. So the one-point function could be, for example, is this diagram, right? This vanishes. This superficial degree of divergence is three. D is equal to three. I apologize that in advance, I was using capital D for space, number of space dimensions in the previous course. So here is a superficial degree of divergence. It vanishes, why? You guys know why? Sorry? All? Why? That's a correct statement, but why? Weak zero. But that's correct, but there is even a quicker argument, because then, sorry? I said so. Oh, odd. Uh, odd, odd point functions, yeah. yeah. And this like violates conservation rules. No. Uh, so that's not a violation of operators, just uh, to go back. That's also uh, equivalent to saying Gaussianity. Lorentz invariance, right? But think about it. Why Lorentz invariance forbids this term? I'm not going to say it. Is forbidden by Lorentz. Two point functions, right? Um, the two point function could be a two point function of a fermion or a two point function of a photon. Both of those diagrams we discussed. 
they have different superficial degree of divergence, but they, we saw that they both grow like log lambda. Neither of which matches this. We explained this. This had to do with what? Ward identities. If you recall, when we did when we did look at the two-point function, for example, vacuum polarization, we saw that the diagram has to diverge really horribly. Then we said, oh, if it did the diverge that horribly, it would violate gauge invariance. And luckily, when we did this uh, dimensional uh, regularization, we saw that it does not diverge that way. And it actually, there's a cancellation of the most divergent term and diverges like log lambda, and that was safe. Good. This was this is deeply related to we discussed this in detail to gauge invariance. All right, so three point functions. This is the vertex. D is zero. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it diverges like log lambda, which is in uh it matches what the dimension counting tells you, right? There could be a three point function for uh photon. But it vanishes. Why? Oh, where gave you the answer? <laughs> uh, it's Lorentz invariance. Should I say more or not? All right. All right. What is what is this? If you were, oops, sorry. If you were to describe this, what is it? What is this as a as a as an operator state? This has to be a one point function like this, right? Now this guy is Lorentz invariant. This guy is not. The only way for this this the only way for this whole thing to be consistent is zero, right? Because you perform a Lorentz, you insert two Lorentz u dagger here, that changes the value of this. But u and u dagger leave omega invariant. The only way for that is that you do it, right? Good. Okay, that's what I mean by Lorentz invariant. So that that's kind of the arguments that you need to. Uh, four point function of the photon should also have a divergence, but it doesn't thanks to word identities. Now, I'm not gonna elaborate anymore. It's, I leave it to you guys to think about an analogy with the previous examples, but recall that word identity was the statement that came you, the amputated, amputated diagram should be zero, right? Another way of describing that was, can you describe that a little more physically? So the external legs are on shell. On shell photons do not have degrees of freedom, do not have a degree of freedom along the direction of the propagation. That's the physics of it. A massless gauge boson, a massless boson, right, cannot have a degree of freedom in the direction of its propagation. It had to, we, we saw this in many different ways, right? We saw it from the representation theory, the little group, we saw it from all sorts of ways, right? That's a very crucial state. All right, good. Any questions about this? Yeah. Do you call minus one correspond to? No. The reason is this. Oh, wait a second. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No. Dk over k is log divergent. There's one power up, one power down. Yeah, when I say d4, that's not count. Good. All right. Good try. Good to cross check what I said. Um, so d is only a guide. As we saw, for example, here are a bunch of examples, right, of diagrams. Uh, the degree of superficial degree of divergence of this is zero. 
it would suggest that it should diverge like log, but it's actually finite. So this is not a very, this, this D is not a very good mesh gauge of this. This has D equals zero. It diverges like log the lambda as expected. This guy has D equal two, but because of word identities, it diverges like log lambda. So it violates this principle I told you. This also violates it, but in a horrible way, because D is minus when it's still divergent. Do you guys know why this is divergent? Staring at this, this is a, it's a very, very good exercise. Why, why is this guy, why, why is this guy divergent even though D is minus two? It's related to this top line, but how could that be? Yeah. Go ahead. Because it's combining like a, a divergent part and a, and a finite part, the two, some contribution is divergent. There is, there, that, that is, that, that's the idea. But another way of saying that is that it has a sub diagram that is divergent, right? So this piece of it, this piece of it is this diagram above. It has a sub diagram that diverges and there are these funky cancellations, right? And there's, there's ward identity. The ward identities only apply if the legs are on shell, they're external, right? The internal legs, we don't have those rules, right? And then this is D minus two and still fine. Okay, How, so D, this counting, dimension counting is a guide, but it's still a very good fact. In these space-time dimensions, QED is basically the same. The vertex is still the same. So there are two gammas, oops, sorry. There are two electrons, oops, two electrons and, uh, no, no, that was correct. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> what am I saying? Um, it's still, the, this counting is the same. The only thing that changes is D is in front of L, the number of loops. The reason is that the propagator photon is one over K squared. The propagator of electron is one over K. And we did this, if you recall, in uh, dimensional regularization, we just replaced K, uh, four by, or three plus one by whatever we replace them with, four plus epsilon or minus epsilon, right? So you repeat the same equations that analysis we did before. You learned that in QED, in uh, these space-time dimensions, will depend on n gamma, the number of external legs of uh, photon, uh, photon and electron, and the number of vertices. It's only in four dimensions that is independent of the number of vertices. The sign of this changes in lower than four and higher than four dimensions. In less than four space-time dimensions, more vertices means less divergent. Good, that's good. In D equal four, adding the vertices keeps the same level of divergence. Right, and d larger than four, higher dimensions. As you add more vertices, it gets worse and worse. Right. So the principle is based on that. We split quantum field theories into three groups: super renormalizable ones. These occur in low dimensions, when the number of Feynman diagrams that superficially diverge is finite. Is that clear, the concept? The total number of uh, Feynman diagrams that superficial diverge is fine. Renormalizable theories are the number of amplitudes that superficially diverge are finite, but they can occur at all orders of perturbation theory. Non-renormalizable theories, these are when all amplitudes are divergent, superficial. So let's just pause for a second and let the definition sink in, and I'll give you examples. And I'll play, I'll, I'll explain the role of D equal four, three plus one. Something special happens. So is the definition clear? So QED in less than three plus one dimensions is super renormalizable. 
you could convince yourself of that. I haven't explained that fully, but you could convince yourself that's true. In D equal four, it's renormalizable, and in D larger than four, it's non renormalizable. So, can you can someone just quickly say why is renormalizable in D equal four? Because we just saw three diagrams with log divergences, and the divergence of those diagrams are independent in the number of vertices you put in there, right? So if you take fix the external legs and add more vertices, you're gonna have the same level of divergence, superficial divergence, right? So it can't be that they're super renormalizable. Super renormalizable means a finite number of diagrams diverge. If adding more vertices doesn't change the divergence, they're gonna be infinite, right? So if you, in D equal four, QED cannot be super normalizable. It's either normalizable or non normalizable. It turns out to be normalizable. So, this is the, the structure. And one lesson comes out. At the level of this discussion today, I'm going to give you a lot. I'm going to tell you a lie. A lie is that non normalizable theories are horrible. They're bad. We're going to discard them. That's a lie. They are physical, they're important. But for now, let's just say they are undesirable. The idea of these infinities, if you recall, was that we were pushing these infinities in, connect, in the connection between bare parameters and the observed parameters. If you need an inf if every amplitude diverges, right? Every new measurement requires a new parameter, right? Like so, you cannot predict anything. You cannot renormalize the theory by fixing a bunch of numbers. Renormalizable means that you do a finite number, of, you use do a calculation of finite number of amplitudes to renormalize a bunch of constants, and then you're done. Every other amplitude past that point could be calculated. Super renormalizable is just like a piece of cake. It's very good. Is the idea clear? At this level, non-renormalizable is bad because it's not predictive. The theory lacks predictability. Good, clear, why I say that? Okay, so that was for QED. Let's discuss scalar field theories. The scalar field theory we're gonna discuss is gonna, well, this is the scalar field theory. This is Lagrangian, right? So del, half del mu phi squared minus uh, half m squared phi squared minus lambda or n, n factorial phi n. The number of external legs, let's call it capital N, number of propagators P, capital V is the number of vertices, similar analysis. This is the same thing. Then you, you have you have the, your three relations. You write your three relations. I trust you guys could reproduce these. You learn that the superficial degree of divergence could be written in this way. It does depend on the number of vertices on less space-time dimension. Actually, no, it does. <laughs> it does depend on the superficial degree of freedom, unless you tune N to your space-time dimension. That's a coincidence that happens in four dimensions. So in D equal four, five, four is renormalizable. In D equal three, five, four is super renormalizable. And D equal two, five N for any N is super renormalizable. Remember where five N came from? came from. When we motivate the quantum field theory, we motivated the Lagrangian from the based on the idea of separation of scales and locality. We want to write an expression that's a function of the field and its derivatives. Next, we said separation of scales tells you that we expand in derivatives and powers of phi. Right? That's what we're doing. What is nice is that in two dimensions, two space-time dimensions, one plus one dimensions, all the phi n terms. So when we phi four was just the next order in expansion, right? Let's say you took some function. Let's say your potential is something ugly. It's you know only how to deal with the lower terms in the uh, Taylor series expansion. The moment you include higher terms, the theory is wacky. It's crazy. Right? You don't know how to control it. In one plus one dimensions, luckily, phi n is super normalizable, so you could deal with the whole thing.
Is that good? All right. So there is another concept, which is uh, intimately related. But I would say that this con this is basically the same same another aspect of this dimension counting, but this is more used not in uh, non perturbatively in physics. Well, this side of the story I'm going to tell now. So recall that um, let's set h bar equal one. Yeah. So, so yeah. Is that statement <clears throat> generally true for five uh, we call that, well, we gave it definition of super normalizable, and super normalizable theory seemed nice, right? So in 2D, quantum field theories are very nice. Now, at least from the point of view of perturbation theory, right? At least at the level of perturbation theory, they seem to be very nice. Does that answer your question? I don't want to push it too far. Okay. So in scaling, what? Uh, okay. So h. Let's say h bar equal one. Locality tells you that the action is. Uh, by the way, if you said h equal one, what's the dimensionality of uh, action? S. Zero, right? Zero. Why is that? Yes. Before. Therefore, I mean, we're. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That, that's correct. That's correct. But another way of saying it is this: e to the power of i s h over h bar. We always write this guy. This has to be dimensionless. Otherwise, we cannot explain it. Good. All right. So this means that Lagrangian density has dimension of mass to the power of space. Uh, has the dimension of space time and mass dimensions. So if you just look at the kinetic term, the kinetic ter tell term tells you that the dimension mass dimension of scalar field is d minus two over two. Just memorize this number. This is a very very important number. This tells you that if in your Lagrangian, you have a term lambda n phi n. This phi n has dimension n times d minus 2 over 2. Therefore, the dimensionality of lambda, lambda has a dimension, has mass dimension, this. So in physics, every time you're dealing with couplings, right, it makes no sense to say they are small or large unless you talk about dimensionless one. Right? So now your lambda n, your coupling is dimension four. To make sense of perturbation theory, you can't say that this is demand, this is perturbatively small or not. You need a scale. And then you say lambda compared to divided by the appropriate power of that scale is now small or large. Right? Good. So now here, let me explain it in words. So lambda, let's say, has dimension of scale. Has, sorry, has a dimension of mass, for example, right? Has a dimension of mass, which means that lambda over some mass m, capital M, we can talk about whether it's small or large, to some power, right? To some positive power. Now, as now, this is, as you change your scale, as you increase your m, lambda will have to increase, right? As you decrease your m, your lambda has to decrease. This is 1 over m. You could think of it as inverse length scale, right? So this tells you that if you look at your theory as a particular energy scale with some coupling, as you change the energy scale, your couplings will have to change. If you're, if, okay, good. So let's establish that principle. Is that clear? 
Let me see. If this has dimension of mass, so some positive power, right? As you go towards the infrared, right? Lower masses, should the coupling grow or decay? Decay, right? So this means that if lambda over m, if lambda has dimensional positive dimension of mass, as you go towards the infrared, it grows. That's okay. The opposite is awful. If you have a coupling that as you take the cutoff away, it grows. There is no sense if your coupling grows at higher and higher energies, there is no sense you could make, there's no way you could make sense of that theory. Is that is that clear what? That's the notion of that's intimately tied to a failure of renormalizability, as we're gonna see in a second. Because you say here's some energy scale, this is lambda, and this is your energy scale. You did your measurement at some energy scale, right? So lambda is something. And as it goes to go towards EIR, it grows, which means that in the UV it was small, right? Everything is good as under control. But if it's the other, other way around, as you go to higher and higher energies, this grows. So there's no sense in which this was ever small. There's a better way of expl explaining this. So let's relate the dimensionality of lambda to what we just discussed in terms of dimension counting and uh, vertices. Consider one of these diagrams with N capital N external legs. This diagram can come from, for example, a vertex in your Hamiltonian, a term in your, Hamil in your Lagrangian, eta phi to the power of N. This tells you that the dimensionality of eta has to be this. Good? Now, if this takes contributions with from terms with V vertices, and each vertex is lambda phi N, right? So it will grow like lambda to the power of V. Sorry, they're actually calling both of them lambda. This is the cutoff and this is the coupling. The cutoff to the power of capital D, right? Now, this should be the same as the growth of this guy. So another way of saying it is that this capital, that this capital N, sorry, Yeah, so another way of uh, saying that is that you should, the, 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 this, this diagram will have dimension vertex to the power of D minus N, D minus two over two plus capital D, right? Which should be equal to minus this. If you equate the two, you find this equation, which is precisely what we found earlier. So super, again, we look at these definitions, super renormalizable, renormalizable, and non-renormalizable. When your coupling has positive dimension of mass, meaning that in the infrared, it grows, it's super renormalizable. When it has, uh, we call that relevant operator. We usually call these relevant coefficients. When it has negative dimension, of mass is non-renormalizable. We call them irrelevant. They grow towards the UV. And when uh, they are renormalizable when the dimensionality is zero, right? And for example, lambda phi four in D plus in, in three plus five in four dimensions. These are operators that we call them marginal. Good. Okay, so in summary, here is a very quick summary of the discussion for today. We 
discussed dimension counting as a guide to systematically study the divergences in Feynman diagrams, aka perturbation theory. If in your action, you have a kinetic term plus some interaction, and this all in any operator that you include there, it could be a, it's any function of the field phi and derivatives, right? To something that you put, uh, you put as an interaction. The mass dimension of the coupling decides the renormalizability of this theory. Super renormalizable if the dimensionality of that has, pos if has positive mass dimension, that's good. Renormalizable is oh, okay, it's okay. Not renormalizable is bad, at least at the level of this course for now. But one main lesson I want you guys to take from this lecture is that in lower dimension, quantum field theory is less divergent, better behaved. D equal to one plus one dimension is where you feel really well. Two plus one and three plus one are where things start getting icky. That's why we have actually only successfully defined mathematically made well-defined quantum field theories uh, with local degrees of freedom in two plus one dimension and perhaps three plus one. I think three plus one is an ongoing fight. We don't know yet. But in higher dimensions, is things are pretty bad. Now, you might hear the following statement that quantum field theory in higher than, what dimension I want to say, six space-time dimensions doesn't make sense. Intracting quantum field theory. Do you guys know why? Based on what I told you, you should be able to reconstruct an argument. Because every diagram becomes part of the diagram. Yes, but like there's an aspect. Well, how, how do you see that explicitly? Like, all right, so let's write down scalar field theory in six dimensions, right? So, what does it look like? D6 of x, right? Minus half del mu five squared plus something that's like lambda five to half. The problem is. Anything that you put here beyond mass is going to be bad. Only phi 2 term is okay. That's the problem. So in higher than six space-time dimensions, massless field theory works like charm. It's just it's perfectly fine. fine. But what we call interactions is problematic. Right? Now, the truth of it is that it's a little bit more sophisticated and complicated than this. The lesson still is there. In our modern understanding of quantum field theory, we think six dimensional, actually, six dimensional quantum field theories are, well, if you haven't told you about uh, RG flows, but there's a beautiful story. But in, in higher than six dimensions, in the absence of gravity, quantum field theory doesn't make, we don't think that interacting quantum field theory makes sense. Once you include gravity, the belief is that 11 is the right number. But above that is all the chunk. Doesn't make any sense. All right. So this is the end of this lecture. Are there any questions? This is a shorter lecture because it's lecture one. I still don't understand how like uh, how the mask is in the couple. So because the dimensionless quantity, so when you say the theory is perturbative, it means that a parameter is small, which means that the dimensionless parameter, dimensionless coupling is small. Now, the theory comes with a scale, as you've seen, right? There are divergences. You have to define it as a scale, right? When the dimensionless thing is fixed, as you change the scale, your coupling changes, right? To keep the dimensionless parameters the same. Correct, correct. Now, if it grows in the UV, that's bad, right? Because in your integrals, you want it to, the integrals always run all the way to the UV, right? That's why it's bad. The IR is, 
if there are masses, masses cut them off. Right? So mass is a natural infrared cutoff. But we saw that there are IR divergences in theories that are ma have massless degrees of freedom, right? Like gauge theories. The IR divergences are precisely there, yeah, as, as precisely as you said. Like there are an issue in the other part of the, the story, right? So there is some sort of a funny thing that like some, yeah, things that are growing in the IR are good from the UV point of view, but if they can grow forever all the way to the IR, they're gonna cause you trouble, right? Okay. All right, any other questions? This is the end of this lecture. How does any of this change even if I allow gravity to be a Oh yeah, let's not get there. That's very complicated. I, I just wanted to tell you that more modern understanding that is a lot more involved. It's actually is related to the representation theory. Yeah, the same. Are you talking about like the semi This argument I'm I'm giving you is like classical, right? I don't know the Sorry, I didn't understand. But the background is canonical. Uh, like it's like about what you've been saying that the semi classical transmission is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Okay, we go. Whole bunch of things. Uh, all right. I, I, th I think I, I did not explain myself correctly. I was not talking about quantum gravity. So, quantum gravity is pretty bad. <laughs> Quantum gravity in four dimension is like awfully not normalizing, right? It's, it's pretty bad. We'll learn soon that there is nothing inherently wrong with non renormalizable theories. What non renormalizability means is that if, if you were taking your integrals all the way, so these are your integrals, right? D, D, K, something, right? All the way to infinity, we get divergences and the theory is ill-defined, which tells you that maybe the behavior at the UV, in the UV is gonna change. Maybe there are other particles in the theory you didn't know about. Those particles are gonna show up and take care of this seeming UV divergence, make it more mild. So non-renormalizability is a signature of you not understanding the UV behavior of your theory. The theory is ill-defined if you want to mathematically, you want it to be mathematically rigorous without any new particles, right? It's ill-defined. You'll, you'll see examples of this. Quantum gravity as a, in four dimension, as a theory without any extra degrees of freedom is non renormalizable it's bad. Which means that there are degrees of freedom deep in the UV, stringy mode, some other stuff that you missed. Those guys are gonna show up, cut off the number of degrees of freedom. These theories have too many degrees of freedom. They're gonna cut them off, right? And make the UV behavior better. But as you said, there's nothing inherently wrong with doing quantum gravity as semi-classical gravity. Order by order perturbation theory, loop, you know, quantum gravity to third loop, second loop as some, Effective field theory. That's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. Well, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Uh, is the fact that the coupling constants can run, can that save or ruin normalizability? Or are we going to talk about like their coupling? So here, when I say they're running, um, the, the running is not what I'm here. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. this wasn't running, but I'm saying yeah. is the fact that they they can run to not mess this up or, or oh yes, 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 yes. This this is an analysis based on the free fixed point, right? <laughs> based on you look you read off the dimensionality from this term and try to generalize it, right? But the truth is that the inclusion of this term makes the dimensionality of this different. So it gives us uh, some sort of an anomalous dimension. We call it, we'll see, you'll see. We're gonna call it anomalous dimension. Those are the sort of log logs of lambda. So those logs are good.
logs are the things that have to do with running of couplings. Um, any other questions? Uh, equals, uh, so when you have n equals two, in that case, uh, there is no problem, right? Like yeah, free fields. Yeah, massive free fields is perfectly fine. That that's consists in hundred twenty seven dimensions as well. Yeah. So. No, it's not. Um, so. There are issues with PyQ. There are other issues with PyQ as well. What what other issues do you guys know based on the principles I've told you? You already know about. Yes, that's it. Yeah. The vacuum is unstable. Classically. You'll have to do a full analysis, but yeah. Any other questions? So the lesson today was that low dimensions are good, high dimensions are bad in terms of the UV behavior, right? And pay attention to dimensionality of your objects, your operators, pay attention to that. The more derivatives you have, the more it grows or in the UV, in the IR or decays in the IR. Think about it, I'm not gonna. The more, derivatives your operator has. Is it going to grow in the IR or is it going to decay in the IR? Decay. Yeah. Decay? Is that the call? Why? Exactly. That's it. Every del mu is k mu and IR means smaller k. All right. Um, which means what? Actually, which means what? Which means that you could put an unlimited number of derivatives. You make them worse and worse. Those operators, you make them worse and worse, right? So meaning that here, if I were to add a lambda of O, I should only try the low derivative operators. The higher derivatives are just worse and worse, right? You never need to check 131 derivatives. All right. Uh, any last questions? Not. Thank you so much, guys. And uh, 